What's up, gamers? Welcome to episode 36 of the Business Casual Gamers podcast. This is the show focused with, on gamers with jobs, families who have things to do in real life. My name is Chris Smoke, and I am, as always, co-hosting with the illustrious Mr. Aaron Connick. How are you, Aaron? I'm great, Chris. How are we doing this week? Very good, very good. You know, it's starting to get really nice outside here in, in Georgia. We're having some fun with the weather. And it's, it's perfect it's, to stay inside and play video games. <laughs> exactly. You know, that's the thing about the sun. It just kind of hurts your skin. It's really not very helpful, healthy but, but for Chris, you. But Chris, this is why you hooked me up with the Vita, so I could solve it, this problem and go outside <laughs> and play my games. It's a well, beautiful mirror. if you can see the screen in the, in the sunlight. Yeah, that's a, but, you know, that's beyond the point. That's beyond the point, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you're having a great day. We hope you really are excited about this episode. It will be a very good one, I think. Um, but before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about how you can find us. You can check us out at businesscasualgamers.com. That is our website that links you to absolutely everything we do from YouTube to Twitter to iTunes to Google Play. You name it, it's there. Uh, while you're doing that, please take us take a moment to rate us on iTunes, subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at BIS Casual Gamers. You will definitely, I think, get your money's worth listening to us and our banter back and forth on Twitter. It's, and if it's, you review it's us, crazy. I've still got a stack of free games to give away. So review us and get free games. You get paid. We will bribe you for your praise. There you go. There it's you just go. that simple. Most of the games aren't terrible. No, they aren't. Most of the games aren't terrible. There's so. like two of them that there's, are. But are like I really said, I put in them there. on there. Most of them, there's two. There's two real bad ones. But I honestly figured, Chris, that somebody who is a collector might appreciate a mint copy. No. No. Not just, really. Just burn it? No. Okay. I think I think what you should do, I would challenge the viewership just to go out there and, and rate us on iTunes, get the horrible game or games from Aaron, and then like burn them in effigy, put it on Twitter or something like that. I'm okay with that. Really that that is where they belong. That That is, along with Child of Eden. Anyway... <laughs> So, not, not, not on the list. Yeah, yeah. So we should we should move on. Check us out. Uh, all the things on the on the website, businesscasualgamers.com. Uh, we really, really enjoy your participation there. And, of course, the Twitter stuff has been really fun uh, lately. We've been going back and forth with a number of people, so we, we want to continue to do that. And I actually streamed a little bit as well. Um, I've actually upgraded my internet connection at home, so it makes doing the podcast a lot easier, the YouTube stuff a lot easier. It also means we can do a little bit more streaming. So that will happen uh, at some point soon. You will not, you cannot, must not miss out on me failing at games. And that's it all can't I'll say be about missed. that. It, can't, it, it just cannot be missed. But this is probably the longest time it's taken us to actually get to an episode, topic of the week, and that's what we are known for. Aaron, what is our topic of the week this uh, episode. So Chris, I would like to fill you in on that, but let me patch in uh, my mm. outsourced counterpart uh, ah. that, that covers the, all of our coverage for business casual gamers in Uzbekistan, Chris, because it's very important. <laughs> patch them in, patch them in. We got to <laughs> so, know this. So Chris, uh, I only say this partially in jest because today we're going to talk about the outsourcing of game development. So for those of you who have been in the hobby for a long time, like us, th there was a point in your life where for the few games that maybe you could actually beat, or you were at a friend's house when you watched it hit the credits, you could probably fit most of the game credits. Maybe it f spilled over to like a second screen, but you could probably just freeze it on one screen. Right, you could right. get most of the important people. Nowadays, you, know, you have <laughs> game credits that are so bloated that I could literally take an entire work day, come home, and yeah. the credits, the special thanks are still rolling for the caterer of the person who got special thanks five oh years gosh. earlier. It, you know, it, it's funny, Chris, because I, I, I know we, we're going to talk a lot throughout this topic on both the pros and the cons mm -hmm. and what we think the consequences uh, of, of this trend have been. But, but I certainly will say that one of the things that jumped out to me as we were writing this show was we've been talking about a lot of great games, certainly throughout our, our you know, Hall of Fame uh, entrance. A lot of the games and a lot of the personalities in the industry that we've gotten to know, I don't want to say it was entirely through video game credits, so to speak, mm -hmm. but I do think it was a, it had a lot to do with the generally smaller teams and knowledge of who were the right. people that were making your games. Yeah. And I certainly feel like now uh, that that is that's gone away a little bit. Now I want to start the episode by mm -hmm. highlighting there was a Wall Street Journal article within the past couple of weeks. Uh, the title of the article, for those of you who have a subscription or want to look it up, uh, it's called uh, "Why a Seventy-Five Billion Dollar Business Is Getting Out of the Hiring Game." And it was a really cool article. Yeah, it certainly, really was. anytime I see games kind of on the the front page section, I, I always look there immediately. 
Uh, but they focused on a lot of different companies. But it really, the article followed the story of Rocket League, a game that mm-hmm. I actually just gifted to Chris not long ago. Hey, yeah. And it was a really cool story talking about how this game clearly has taken off. It's doing really well. But it focused on the fact that the full-time staff that was making this game was fairly small. Smaller, yeah. I mean, certainly less than 100 people. And uh, you, you, But you had a ton more of people who were on either a part-time schedule or who were outsourced that were contributing to the game. So probably somewhere in the order of two, three, four times the number of people mm. on the full-time team. And to me, it got me thinking about how pervasive this has become. Because let's face it, Chris, let's say that Rocket League was made by a team of 200. Mm-hmm. We all know when it, you're talking about the biggest of the big budgets, you're not talking about 200 people. No, you're no, You're talking not about all. five, six, seven, eight hundred people at this point. Uh, you, you've got the team that is that is doing, let's call it the programming. But no, 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 Chris, you can't have them program everything. Oh, you have to not. have again the you know the Ubisoft Kazakhstan team uh, programming they the left the butt best. cheek physics. They are, and, oh, and what you hope is better. the yes. the team in Toronto that's doing the right butt cheek physics. You hope that they're using the same code bank. You hope that they're talking to each other. But if it doesn't move right, we'll know it. <laughs> exactly, we'll know, we'll it. know it. So, so I want to start yeah. off, Chris. But uh, you know, we're, we're going to do the compliment sandwich in this episode. So, Chris, I talk to me about: are, are there some positives that we've seen from the the uh, what I'll call the ballooning and the outsourcing yeah. of yeah. the development project? Well, actually, you know, before we get into that, the one thing that I did want to mention is a very, very uh, interestingly timed article because I was watching the Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, I guess it's making of video. It's on YouTube. Okay. You should go look it up. Horizon Zero Dawn, making of or whatever. Uh, and I was, what struck me was um, one of the Guerrilla Games folks was talking, one of the producers or something like that was talking about the game. And he, he mentioned that they had some outsourced teams. And, and this was really the first time, you know, we'll get into it, of course. But and I've heard some things about indie developers. You know, obviously, when you have small, uh, small companies or startups or whatever, um, having real, quote unquote, employees versus contracted, you know, people who look kind of like employees there are many, you know, many reasons why you might want to go one route or the other. And I'd never really thought about large scale outsourcing efforts across the video game industry. I'm sure, you know, I knew it goes on even before the article, I kind of knew it went on. Um, but one of the points that he made was he said, you know, if you look at the the Horizon Zero Dawn credits, you'll notice there are about a thousand people in there. Yeah. And and that was what that really struck me. In fact, I think I texted you about it or, or, or you know, hit you, tweeted you with it because it's like. That's a lot. Of, that's an amazing amount of people. It's now, so to your point, so let's talk a little bit about what would be positive about this. And I think that you know one of the things that um, immediately strikes you as far as a, a positive would be that you know there are more games, more ambitious titles could be taken on. Right? Absolutely. We've talked about how you know in the indie sphere how there are only so many kinds of things you can take on um, because it's a very large scale, high, highly demanding, artistic and programming wise. Uh, and performance-wise application you're really building here. And so I can understand how more people will give you, in theory, a better product, right? The other thing about this that I thought was really nice was that we've seen this a lot in Call of Duty and other games where uh, you might have a core team that's like known for a campaign, actually do the campaign, and they may contract out uh, with another studio, whatever, that, that has more availability to go do the multiplayer, right? Here are the assets, here's the engine, <clears throat> go figure out the net code, go figure out how to do right. capture a flag or whatever it might be. You know, that actually, I think that's more of a traditional mecha- mechanism for outsourcing in games that, that I can understand. And I think it's also it's also pretty valuable for us. I, I think. Yeah, and I think certainly the multiplayer games, that when you think of most of the games, honestly, these days, have even games that you don't think should have a multiplayer component. We've talked about it on a past show, but it seems like multiplayer has to be a part of everything. Right, or at least right. that's what a lot of the big budget developers and uh, and publishers have convinced themselves and to me, I, I even though there are times where I say, oh, I don't think that thing needed multiplayer or I think that's going to fail because it's just a crowded marketplace and people only have so much time, you would not be able to, to release these games once mm-hmm. a year, once every other year, unless you had this distributed outsourced development model to your point. Because if the team had to finish the single player and then they had to turn to the multiplayer, right. You're building at half be, speed at that point, yeah. and then you're getting half the games effectively. So I, I do totally agree with you that when you look at both the amount of features that get built 
And something we're going to talk about on a future episode, we're going to talk about downloadable content. Mm -hmm. You can have a lot of people working on a lot of different things as long as you have the plan on the outset. Yeah, and you know, you think about from a technical perspective, when you when you think about an online multiplayer component versus a single player component, I mean, it's, if, if you assume that all the baseline assets are there, all the models, all the textures, all the level, whatever it might be, maybe not the levels, but a lot of the that kind of stuff is done. You know, uh, the net code and those kinds of things are actually very, um, they're very specific skill sets to know how to write a really right. solid net code, like, you know, with Blizzard for its PvP stuff or anything like Modern Warfare or Call of Duty or something like that, right? Well, you made a great point, Chris. When you talk, and I think it's a, honestly, it's a great example. When you talk about Guerrilla Games, when you look at Horizon, that game looks gorgeous. And we yeah, both really talked does. about it on the show. Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen by accident, and it doesn't happen because you're using this super cool engine that nobody else has. Mm -hmm. There is a ton of sweat equity. And when I think of going back all the way back to the NES, the the thing that for people who have been out of the hobby for a long time, or people who have never been in the hobby, Mm -hmm. the first thing that when you put two games side by side, forget the physics, forget all of the, the length of games and the complexity of the storytelling... The first thing that jumps out at them is, wow, this game looks great. It looks like real life. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen without a ton of people making sure that each little detail that you might encounter throughout the game world looks just like you would expect it to. The physics work the way you would expect it. Things interact on the screen the way you would expect it. And that just takes a small army of people to really get it at the quality level that the top games have. And, and I do look at that and I say, <clears throat> even though I feel like when certainly some of the indie games we talk about are the lower budget developments, we say that the art style looks great or the game, it does what it needs to. It conveys a sense of place or, or mm-hmm. identity. The reality is it's very tough to hold any game up to something like a Horizon that was made by a team of 10 and right, say, right. oh, this looks as good as Horizon. No, it doesn't. It just right. It's different, and it looks appropriate for what it's trying to do. But to get a level of realism and, and true to form, I can mm-hmm. go anywhere in this massive world, and it just works – that takes a lot of people. Well, think about it. You know, and it, it, I, I would say that challenge the listeners, at least, just to think about a little bit more. And, and as I've gotten more, you know, my background is software development and, uh, and and I've done a lot of different types of development. But game development is inherently very different in a sense. Uh, not only that it includes more artistic components that I mentioned, but also that kind of programming mindset. I challenge you when you go play your next game. So let, we'll take Horizon as an example. You know, you're and you're looking at Aloy, and you're looking at all these other uh, interacting, you know, these people, these things in a in a room, for example, in a in a town. You know, notice that every little prop, every cup, every chair, every table, every you know scroll on the wall, every mark on the ceiling, whatever it might be, all of that was done by not just one person, by multiple people, right? So, someone has modeled that chair. Then someone has come in and textured, put materials on that chair, and they have probably taken pictures of real wood grain, or you know, and then they've they've uh, pulled out like what they call the normals, right? So you basically they've they've uh, lack of a better term bump mapped that chair so that when you put wood grain on it, it actually looks like it's really contoured right. wood. So like five six people have put into put effort into building that chair. Now think about a character like Aloy, like to 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 create animations for her to create the skeletal system. Um, when you look at things like uh, um, when you look at her face and, and see how her face moves, and start, some of that's motion capture, of course, these sure. days. But you'd be surprised, like the artists for these this, these games and some of the CG kinds of things you might find in the movies. I mean, they'll put 15, 20 different layers of like muscles and skin so that when when they smile, it actually pulls the muscles underneath the eyes or whatever, just like it would anatomically. Right. And, and, and to your point, Chris, when you think about the game that you've been talking about mm-hmm, making, mm-hmm. You, you know, when we've looked at, let's just say you don't have that skill set and you say, okay, I know how to program, but in terms of getting the fidelity of the artwork and the graphics, and you know, I just, I don't have experience doing that. I think having this outsourced model where you have a bunch of highly specialized people to say, mm-hmm. Hey, if I need the person that does facial animations, there is a person that their whole job is to do this and right, they do right. it on different games. You know, the overall and you need them quality, for like a small portion yeah, of time over that's the course you need of the project. Them for. Exactly. Right. You're going to code the thing, but there, there is, I think the, the specialization that's been able to occur, I think is directly attributable to why games mm-hmm. look so much better. And they're, you know, I look back at, and we've talked about it uh, as, as you've been going through your development process, 
if you look back at the PS3 and uh, Xbox 360 era, Unreal Engine, uh, say, you know, certainly what you will, uh, but all of the stuff that was built up around, uh, you know, having an engine or Mm -hmm. having, you know, pre-programmed tools, things like that. I think that that was the first era where you were you saw the first generation of games. It got stood up on the backs of having a pre-built yeah. engine where people yeah. said, okay, I'm going to go in. I'm not going to do what a lot of the Japanese companies, frankly, are doing where they're starting from scratch and they're building all their tools from the ground up. They just said, no, somebody else has built it. I'm going to learn how to play in their sandbox. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's not, mm-hmm. quote unquote, mine. Like I didn't code the thing from the ground up, <laughs> but I sure got right. a game to market faster and it did what I needed it to do. And I, I just feel like that you know, the the fact that we moved to this specialized model where they said I'm not going to employ full time an army of programmers to build this, <clears throat> right. but I am going to get a better, more cohesive product at the end. Right. Of it. Yeah, and it's true. And, and to go back to my original point about like building these these props and things. I mean, so when I and I've learned through this. You know, I, I spent a lot of time doing CG uh, stuff for 3ds Max and Maya back in early '90s, mid '90s, and then on. And, and frankly, it's one of the things I wanted to do with a career uh, before I got more into programming. And so I feel like you know, I come into this as a, as a kind of an indie developer, solo indie dev. I come into this process kind of saying, well, I can theoretically make decent versions of everything I need for a game, minus maybe music, right? But then I sit down and I start to build the model for a character, right? A female character in this game. And it takes me three, four, five, six, seven, eight days, eight nights, you know, an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever. And that's just to get the model. And then you have to do the skinning and all the stuff you have to do to get a model working. And then, oh, by the way, maybe there are 50 characters in this game. And, oh, man, I forgot to do the chair that we talked about before. And so I really do see why people do this because it is so incredibly time consuming. And any sort of artistic process is... Um, one of the things that struck me again, you go back to games like Uncharted 4, I had I read a lot of dev blogs when I can, or blogs of devs, um, maybe not so sponsored by their their company. And there was, there was one guy who was relatively, I think, new to the industry inside of two or three or four years who had done a blog post about how he had done the cover grass in, in Uncharted 4. And it was cool. He had some screenshots about all the systems and all that kind of stuff. And so again, back to my analogy or back to my, my, my challenge to the audience, Think about everything that goes into these games. When your character like Aloy or, or you know, your characters in Uncharted are reacting to the fact that they're, you know, in this grass and the grass is waving a little bit more or they're in water and the water is reacting because they're in it, the characters are in it, someone wrote that, right? right? Not only did someone wrote that, someone had to sit down and think about how feet will interact when it's interacting with like rushing water versus standing water versus whatever and how do I physically model that in, in the physics engine and how do I? And then, the, you know, you could model it really easily, but now you've got to get it to run at 30, 40, 60 frames a second or whatever on a PS4. Oh, so now I've got to figure out how to estimate it, right? And so I, I, that is really, I mean, I know I'm beating the dead horse here, but we're really talking about extremely challenging um, technologies and things you have to do, and they all have to be firing on all cylinders or the game's not going to look great. That's right. And then the last point I want to make before we get into some of the, maybe the negatives that we've seen and this may be controversial, the reality is, and the article that I noted uh, mentions this, and I've read others that have said the same, when you look at the viability of a studio, certainly they are thinking about the financial viability of the products that they're making Mm -hmm. and saying, it is a whole lot easier to have a staff of 50 full-time than a staff of 200 Mm full-time. And video game industry is very notorious for bringing somebody on for a period of time, a game's done, letting people go and mm-hmm. going to the next. And it's certainly, it's an emotional roller coaster. Any of us who have been through watching a company go through job losses or anything like that, it's an emotional time. You're dealing with people's lives and certainly going to more of an outsource or people call it the gig economy, going mm-hmm. to that kind of a model uh, the article talks about a person who is doing testing somewhat in customer service around Rocket League, and they're in South America, and it lets them kind of work on their own time in their own place, and they're mm-hmm. up in a bedroom with a computer and a phone and, and a copy of the game, and it allows that person to be employed. And, okay, maybe they don't have the full-time gig and benefits and all of the things that you might associate and say, well, this is what we need more of in the industry, 
But at the same point in time, it does prevent that person from getting brought on for two months, then let go. It right, just allows right. them to support this game. And then if they want to support something else in their spare time, they can do that. And it, it does allow these these people who are getting increasingly specialized to have a viable working model to maybe mm-hmm. have a couple of different things going on and not have to go through this boom and bust development cycle. Uh, but at the same time, it's very costly for studios. Mm-hmm. Think of if Horizon had done poorly. Yeah, you just yeah. paid a thousand people. You who knows how probably a hundred million dollar game to make Horizon. If that game would have been a flop. Now you suddenly have this studio of a thousand people that you've got to support. I mean, right. they're all out of you're business. You're laying them all off. So if you're a little bit leaner, I can certainly appreciate the developer point of view to say it allows us to absorb the blows a little bit easier and not have to bet the farm on every game. I've been reading about that for years, but I think as the development budgets of these games continues to soar mm-hmm. and it becomes more like the movie industry, uh, which honestly at this point the, the article notes that the, the video game industry has eclipsed the movie industry. And so this is a bigger issue. Mm-hmm. This is something that if you want the big developers to continue to be viable and to be able to make the next hit, they've got to be able to absorb the flops just as much as they have to be able to to enjoy the successes. Yeah, and I think from a positive perspective, I think that a lot of the a lot of the types, you know, I I'm, I'm the same way. A lot of the creative types and even some of the more technical types um actually like that kind of an opportunity to to come in and say work for 6 months on something and then and, you know in 6 more months you're working on something different, right? They don't they don't want to come in and you know and 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 I'm sure some people no offense to anyone who want, who likes to do that, but I think a lot of people don't want to come in and model the same coffee can over and over again or or change the skin on the same character over and over again like you would get with a big, you know, a big developer, uh, you know, company. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. But you bring up a really, really good point here with the hundred million dollar comment. And and that really let's let's drive that into the overall um, negatives that we'd see in this particular uh, kind of an outsourcing model. And I think that. One of the biggest negatives I see, and it's more of a question, and maybe it's rhetorical, I don't know, but do we feel like, you know, are games losing their character in a sense uh, as the production becomes so decentralized? We talked about some of the concerns, you know, uh, some of the pauses of having, you know, multiplayer done by one studio and and single player done by another. But, you know, when, we, when you have a team that's, say, maybe in East Asia and the rest of the teams in California or Europe and East Coast U.S. or South America and Africa, whatever, you know, what kind of issues will we run into along those lines? Yeah, the first time I actually remember thinking about this, and it really slapped me in the face and I said, I don't know if this is a good thing, is when the first Assassin's Creed was released. Now, mm-hmm. Ubisoft was one of the most noted companies for having a ton of different studios all around the world. And if you look at their credit reels, those were some of the meatiest credit reels that mm-hmm. I had ever mm-hmm. seen at that point in time. And and I remember looking at the game, and it was this technical marvel at the time where it looked great. You had all this realistic movement that could occur around a city. But when you added it all up and you looked at the game, mm-hmm. where you said, what am I doing? And am I having fun doing it? It was just a boring game. It yeah. really was. And, and I just looked at that and I said... I've got to believe that at a point in time, everybody was assembling their own little piece of the puzzle and you're kind of filing it away and saying, okay, I've got these specs and I've got this development. I've got to build my piece or I don't. Yeah. And and I'm building this puzzle piece that in the back of my mind, I am envisioning fitting as part of this overall larger puzzle. And then right towards the end of development, it feels like they tried to assemble the puzzle and some pieces they fit perfectly. Yeah. And other pieces well, I, I didn't think your piece was supposed to fit with mine like that. I, I, I didn't build mine like that. And it, <laughs> it kind of feels like you, you you get to this point where they announce a release date and you say, all right, well, the piece, this side, this corner of the puzzle, it kind of looks like garbage. and It doesn't really fit yeah. well together, but it's like crunch I got time. a ship date to me. Gotta make it happen. And this Gotta thing's going in a box and going on a shelf somewhere. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I was watching, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, Noclip, which is Danny O'Dwyer's um, really interesting uh, company or group that's, that's building documentaries on games. And we talked a little bit about the Doom documentary. If you haven't seen it, uh, please go out and look at it on YouTube. Just look for the Doom documentary. Uh, and no clip. And so one of the funny parts one of the developers mentioned was, you know, it's like they were getting really close to being able to ship this st- or to ship this game. And there were a whole bunch of bugs. Like he said, like the sound would go out or whatever it might be. Really, really kooky bugs. And then he got to the point where he's like, okay, is it working? Is it working? Okay, don't touch it. Don't breathe on it. Don't do anything. Yeah. Just, just, just leave it. 
put it on the disc and ship it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? and don't and, break it. Right, don't break it. And that's the thing. I, I certainly can see that. That's that's a big challenge that all software development groups, I think, face across the world. And and when it comes to these kinds of high performing kinds of games and things, I think that's really uh, that is a really big point to make. And you spend so much time on the technical aspect, right? We talked about how somebody's got to skin the chair, somebody's mm-hmm. got to model the grass physics, and so much time and energy has to be spent just assembling the world, so to speak, yeah. and, and making a game that when you have this, so much of the project management, I have to imagine having, you know, we've both managed large teams, when when it takes so much time and attention and focus just to create that, mm-hmm. I could certainly see a world in which you assemble it all and you're just, you're, you're relieved that it works. Just like that, right. that you, we say, I'm actually not having all that much fun playing it and I don't know why it's better than this older <laughs> game, but man, I built this killer world that looks so cool that mm-hmm. I just, it took me so much where you almost feel like it's a, you know, it's a plea for sympathy from the developers at times to just appreciate how much work that clearly did go into making some of these games just work and not break. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. No, so one of the things that always that, that, kind of comes to mind here uh and i'm, I'm gonna say it kind of weirdly i think but one of the things that i'm I, i'm concerned about from this perspective is you know the hundred million dollars we're putting tons and tons of money into this game and, and are we kind of succumbing to this kind of michael bay explosion 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 kind of a game set you know hear me out here because think about movies you know movies have gotten have gone from you know, having to rely on the content of the story, the characters, the protagonists, you know, all those kinds of things and, and that interaction, the acting to now it is about the acting and those kinds of things. And many movies are like that, but they're also this other subset of movies kind of like, you know, Michael Bayish Transformers, Call of Duty, like like movies in a sense where it's just action. It's more explosions. It's more in your face, more CG, you know, overly CG. And I'm really wondering if um, we have gotten to the point where we have dug the ruts, like so to speak. We have this trail that we're going down, and the ruts and the, where the wheels are are so deep and so entrenched that we keep making the same movies and the same games, you know, with very little small kinds of uh, deviations from the genre, you know, every single iteration. And the only impetus to to create more, you know, you can't you can't fight to get out of that rut. Number one, but number two. Because you're in that rut, the next game, if it's $100 million now, the next game better be 120 and then yeah. 140 then $200 million. Where do you stop? Well, two thoughts on that. So one, I think a great example of what you just described that stands out to me as, as you say that is Final Fantasy XV. So the article cites that the Final Fantasy XV crew mm-hmm. employed over 70 contracting firms to get the game That's built. That's insane. And so when you talk about how many puzzle pieces are being made by different parts of the world and different teams that aren't, aren't all wearing the same team name on the back of the jersey, I can look at the, <laughs> the, 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 the fight or the scene that made me put the game down was the the scene where you meet Leviathan and you're trying to essentially recruit or bargain with Leviathan. The lead up, the the, the world, the the when you uh, I, I'm forgetting the name of the town. Uh, I think Doesn't it's Alticia, but uh, you you get there. This world that they built is gorgeous. The scene where Leviathan comes up, the you know, the model is amazing. It's really epic, and then you get into the battle. And the camera goes haywire. And the, yeah. uh, you have, it looks so cool. And they built this amazing scene, but they can't get something as simple. I could just imagine the developer sitting there watching me play this and saying, okay, this is going to be so cool. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't jump at that spot. It doesn't work if you do it there. I've, I've noticed oh this gosh. before. And I just felt like I was beating my head against the wall saying, I felt like everybody worked so hard of, okay, you make Leviathan and you make the town and you make the water effects. And nobody got to assemble it and just see. Nobody make the game. Does yeah? Nobody like who makes sure that it fits within the engine and that it doesn't just spaz out when you actually have to pan the camera around all this action. And what if I do this? And I, I just feel like it's leading to this overall lack of finish and polish in games. The second thing I want to note is, is something that honestly, if you look back at our last episode where we talked about our game collections. A lot of what I've been acquiring over this past generation is remakes or, mm-hmm. or remasters of existing games. And people have called this the remaster generation, where mm-hmm. frankly, if you look at a lot of the top-selling games, a lot of the highest-rated games uh, across 
the, both the PS4 and the Xbox, but I would say definitely the PS4 because there's a lot of Sony stuff that they're trying to bring back. A lot of what I'm buying is just the best version of a game that's older. Yeah. Because I feel like at this point, development studios, they are doing exactly what you described, where they are trained that what players want is a better version. A, you know, it mm-hmm. looks better. It runs mm-hmm. better. It has a better frame rate. It's this, you know, this texture or this slight system that we didn't get quite right because we didn't have time to polish it before we shipped it. Well, now we have time and we know you'll pay us again. So we'll do that for you. I look at that and I say, uh, Final Fantasy Twelve. I, I pre-ordered the Final Fantasy Twelve remake. I liked the game. The game had problems. And they supposedly, with this uh, remake, they, they were trying to address some of the game systems that didn't work. They Everybody made fun of Vaughn's abs looking like they were spray painted on. Mm-hmm. They've remodeled Vaughn's abs so go. they look normal. But this is what developers, I feel like, have been trained by the public that they think the public wants. And they say, I'm going to keep giving it to you because... Frankly, it's a lot lower risk to just stay in my wheelhouse right. and give you the better looking version of a game you already love than it is to try and assemble this Frankenstein monster of a new IP that I don't even know if you like. Yeah, I mean, I can't help but think we're we're kind of getting away from what makes games good in a sense. I mean, it's, you know, we talked about... You know, we do, fair in fairness, we do spend a good bit of time talking about how great graphics are. We've done it this episode oh, sure. already. Um, but I think that, you know, there are a lot of... This is why we... And I keep beating on the indie drum. I think this is why I, li- I like a lot of the indie stuff. Because, you know, it when you're a one or two or three person team and, you know, you're paying your buddy, you're paying your artist paying your artist friend like 300 bucks to draw some stuff for you or whatever it might be or, or, or provide some music or whatever. When you're putting all that together, you know, you can't you can't rely on the best looking sprites or the best looking models, the best music in the world. You have to rely on what is this game supposed to be doing? Is it supposed to elicit some sort of emotional response from me? Is it supposed to make me feel sad or happy? And is it doing that? Or is it supposed to be addicting just a simple puzzle game or whatever it might be? Right. And that, you know, you see so many people, that's all they really have to focus on. Is the gameplay. Bu- you can't do this Wizard of Oz thing where you have the smoke and the big voice and you say, oh, look at my graphics and right. look at how cool this scene is. There, To your point, it's just a stripped down version of an idea and it's built up to, in many cases, the minimum viable thing to make it presentable so that somebody understands the concept. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it has to stand or fall by, based on the idea and the core gameplay loop. Because it doesn't have all of this other smoke and mirrors and pomp and circumstance to fall back on because they can't afford it or they, yeah. they don't yeah. have the skills to develop it. And, and I think I know we've talked about a lot of the games of the past generation or two that have been smaller scale. I think a lot of what jumps out to me with those games, there's been a lot of those games that I think are not great and mm-hmm. are mediocre. Mm-hmm. But the ones that have really clicked with me, I think that I appreciate the focus and the completion of the thought if you will that i feel like the game that got made is exactly what was intended now i may not like everything that they intended i know i talked about uh, braid on a past episode where i said Mm -hmm. i understand exactly what they were trying to do and in some cases i thought it was clever and in other cases i just didn't like what they offered but i do appreciate the fact that that game felt very consistent i felt like the idea was executed from start to finish and i never felt like the level one I didn't really get where they were going when I got to level five. Like Mm -hmm. this just felt like it was very disjointed or disconnected. I feel like the games tell a story and bring you through that person or that team's thought process where I feel like we talked about, uh, you know, final fantasy 15. I'll go back to it. When we talked about things like, Hey, the character voices in this area don't really fit with the character voices, even though they're all within the same game world. Mm -hmm. Why do these seem so out of place? Or why does this art style seem so different? There are lots of little things that when I encounter it in games that are bigger budget, I just question myself of, is this just because two different groups of people made this and they just didn't talk to each other and it wasn't really anybody managing that process? Well, you're kind of, you kind of get into this weird little uh, loop in a sense. So if you take, you take Nathan Drake, for example, and you show this video of Nathan Drake and he's got this crazy, you know, model and he's got 50 trillion polygons in him, right? And he looks just amazing, and, and you're like, "Wow, this is awesome." Well, what you really, what you've done at that point is you've dug yourself this hole, so that not only does Nathan Drake have to look great, 
everything has to look great. The pencil on the table that's like 300 feet in the background has to look great because some some enterprising, you know, player is going to go out there, find their way to that point, probably a speedrunner, uh, and find that pencil and be like, dude, that pencil looks hideous. What is wrong with you, Naughty Dog? <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's what they end up fighting against. And so... One of the things I want to bring up, I, I bring this up, I feel like every episode now is uh, Oxenfree is a game that I really liked. And that, that was, I think, a three or four person team with a couple of folks who were working on contract basis. Um, they had a really good story. And if you ever played Oxenfree, if you haven't, go look on go look online, just look it up. Uh, do, do Google Images, look at it, look at some of the characters. Uh, the character models are ex- as absolutely simple as possible. But I can't even tell you. Um, like I felt very connected to the characters throughout the game. Uh, I, I really wanted to hear more about them, probably because they did a great job with the voices and the voice acting. Um, but I'll tell you, like I never once realized until after the fact, I started looking at, I, I knew I liked the game and I wanted to, I wanted to analyze why I liked the game for the, for the indie dev stuff I'm doing. And I realized, you know, these models are like really, really simple. There's not even, there's just flat shaded polygon kind of things. And that's my point here about all this stuff. Really, I, I'm wondering if we're getting to the point where, you know, if I have my Nathan Drake with a trillion polygons on him, now I have to make sure my water bottle has a trillion polygons to look just as good. And to make that happen is going to cost $10 million. Or I can just have this, you know, flat shaded or normally shaded, untextured, low poly, you know, girl on the screen and have the entire audience fall in love with who she is and her, yeah. you know, the story I'm trying to tell, you know, for maybe arguably fifty or hundred thousand dollars. You know, what's better? Well, let me ask you a question on that line, Chris. Is when you look at all the different facets that go into a game, I mean anything from programming to specific art to mm-hmm. character animations to storytelling. Is there anything that when you look at a studio and how they staff a game and what they keep in house, are there any functions or areas that you feel like have to be full time, has to be part of the DNA of that studio or the game just doesn't feel right or you you would doubt that game's ability to really execute? Are there any things like that? Honestly, granted, let me say this. uh, It's not like... I'm a game developer or anything, but I'll tell you from my other software development components, uh, or, you know, there are core core teammates that, that will have to be there. You'll have to have some sort of story person, right? Some sort of director in a sense, right? You're going to have to have some core, like, uh, artists and concept artists who can really put together, like, you know, I can describe, you know, a, a character and who they are in a sense, and these people can just, you know, the light bulb goes off. Oh, here it is. Here's like 10 different versions on sketches of how this person could look. And you're like, nope, that third one, that's that's the character right there. You know, those kinds of people will always need to be there. The technical folks will always need to be there to some extent. What I think happens here is not that a developer doesn't have any uh, environment artists. And whenever they go create a game, they go out and hire, you know, contract hire or contract, I guess, with like five or ten environment artists to get this game done. I think it's more along the lines of we've done all the pre-production work we've done, right? We've done all the storylining, storyboarding stuff. We know what's going to happen. Um, we know that there needs to be this CG scene that's like that's going to involve these characters and these models halfway through the game. It's going to be five minutes long, and we don't have time to build it. So let me go pay 200k to this person, this company, to go do that for me. Or it could be. Yeah, you know, I just mentioned my three trillion polygon water bottle and all my props. I need to have someone to go through and build me one to three different versions, you know, completely like the models, materials, everything for this list of 10,000 items I need to be able to use in my game for my world builder to build the world up. And that's probably not something you want to have. And you want to have that kind of, you'll have some of those prop artists in house, but you won't have a lot of them. Now, so, so, in a, in a traditional game development company, I think that's how it works. Now, I do have friends at Blizzard that that's not how Blizzard works now, at right. least not how they used to work. I think they might be shifting slightly. But, you know, they do have 50, probably 12, 15 prop artists on a certain game. And they'll have a, hundred, a team of 100 people who, you know, who come together to work on WoW, for example, and they shift to other projects like Overwatch uh, over time. And they've had some level of layoffs here and there. But by and large, they have this team of X thousand people or whatever and they're, they just shift these people around from product to product to project. And I guess they hope that by the time, uh, you know, project A is done, then B is spinning up. You just take a chunk out of project A's team, move it to B, distribute some extra people to other projects, and you should be good to go. Yeah. I, I thought about this a lot, and 
there are, every time I come up with something where I say, man, I really appreciate that this studio or this development team has this in house. Like give you an mm -hmm. example. I think the having played a ton of persona lately, I certainly appreciate that they have somebody who is handling the music and who is actively involved in the development of the series. I think that's been a hallmark of the series that has always stood out to be going back to the beginning of the series. Mm -hmm. uh, but that said, I look at the pixel junk games, all of that music was outsourced they had uh, it's credited autograph is somebody who is not full-time employee of the company that they contracted with. Uh, I think uh, bygone came back for uh, pixel junk Eden mm -hmm. and they've used different artists. The music sounds very consistent. It sounds completely appropriate for the games. So I said, well, no, maybe that doesn't work. Uh, you look at, I know Final Fantasy, something that's always stood out to me is the fact that they have uh, amazing art teams. And they've right. always said, even regardless of the technical aspects of the game, a game with great art will always be timeless. And I, and I look at the art team that they have and... Uh, I think that, well, maybe that's a core thing. But then I look at other games and say, well, I know that they outsource the art to this. So I don't know that there's any really core area that I feel like you have to have it no. in-house. But the one thing that does stand out to me, and I, 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 I'm going to insert some speculation in this, knowing that, again, uh -oh. I have not worked on a development team. I don't work for a video game company, certainly not on some kind of big production but I know that when you get to the more senior levels of management, when you get to a, you know, a senior producer level or a director or something like that, a lot of what your time is consumed doing is being accountable for budgets, being accountable for schedules, mm -hmm. trying to do you know, diagnose technical problems and get things addressed quickly when something core to the game, you know, a decision needs to be made of this doesn't work. How do mm -hmm. we pivot? How do we get this to work? And how do we get it to fit in the overall time frame that we have? What's important to the game? What can we let go? But what I always notice when I read about both smaller developers and successful larger games is that I feel like as much as that person or that team has to have the 50,000 foot view and do some project management, mm -hmm. I feel like the further you distance that person or that team away from actually just playing the game and saying, do I like playing this game? Does this meet what the objective, when we wrote down on a single sheet of paper, what is this game about? Mm -hmm. Did I achieve that with what I'm playing? And I feel like the more you free up those senior people to have the time and the capacity to just play what they're developing. I've read right. so many instances where things that they always say, there's no part in the game where you just add, you hit the fun switch and the game is suddenly fun. Like that is something that, that is brought out over time and that in many stages, it's not fun until the later stages of the game where you're hoping and praying you can get there. But I feel like when you have those people with the initial vision that have the experience, that, that have the decision-making power to really play and understand the game, that's when I feel like I mm -hmm. think there's a strong correlation between hitting that mark and getting that game that's true to the vision. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. And I think that, so one other point that I do want to make that, that's kind of related to this, it's interesting from, an, from a, uh, again, from more of an indie dev perspective. Um, I follow this, uh, this guy named uh, David on, uh, on Twitter who is creating a game called The First Tree. And you should look up his game, by the way, thefirsttree.com. It looks pretty cool. Um, but one of the things that he said that was very interesting to me was, you know, he's, in, he's a, I think he, he's in the video game industry professionally, but he also, he's coming home and he's building this game by himself. And as a small or a or slash a solo indie dev, you know, they wouldn't survive without this, without some level of what you just described. And, you know, we talked about Unity, or we talked about, uh, about uh, Unreal Engine, and certainly with Unity and these kinds of interesting uh, platforms, because now they have asset stores that allow this to happen on a, like a micro mm -hmm. basis in a sense, right? For me, so one of the things David mentioned was, you know, if at all possible, and this is it's counterintuitive, right? So as someone who has the capability to build the models, to do, you know, maybe some music, to do some concept art, and to program a game, Chris is like, okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go make this game by myself. Why do I need anyone else? I don't need anyone else. I can do a story. I can do all this stuff. That's not true, anyway. By the way, but you know what you would say is uh, what he told us was, you know, this is not where you kind of fall fall on your sword. In a case is it, where you have the ability to reach out and leverage other people's work. So you go to the Unity Asset Store if you need a model for a bear, and they have a model for a bear, and it's like seven dollars. Buy it. 
right? right? Buy what you can get, get it free, license it, whatever you need to do, but take advantage of the resources that other people have made available to you. Put those into your game. If for nothing else, now maybe... Maybe the first version ships with some of those models. Maybe long term you you do get back to doing your own thing. But from a small development perspective, and again, particularly from a solo indie dev perspective, the worst thing in the world, is, especially from a BCG game or a BCG you know, indie dev uh, like me, that may have an hour every three days to do work on on a game, you know, you get extremely uh, kind of dissuaded by the fact that. It's going to take you two weeks to build one character model, and you need a hundred of them to make your game right. work, right? And I think this is where there is a lot of value in this space. And it's it's granted it's non traditional gaming companies or development companies, but if they're companies at all. Um, but the real point here is that that the ability to outsource out there and go out and pay three dollars for uh, an algorithm that helps the grass move, or for you know a, a set of an asset pack with five hundred different trees and waterfalls and rocks. You know, all that stuff is super valuable to making sure that not only, you know, I, I don't think bigger game companies do this or not, but mid-tier and lower game companies um, can go out there and leverage that to really build the game they want to build. And they will, again, like to your point, they will focus on the story. Is it telling what the story that needs to be telling? Is it getting the output we want to get out of it? And we're not spending our time getting tired and sick, you know, of building this rock and getting the texture to look quite right. Yeah, I think maybe we need to subtitle this episode, Always Buy the Bear. Just Always buy the bear. Always buy, buy the bear. You, you got the $7 bear? Just buy the bear. Don't don't animate buy the bear. the bear. Just buy the bear. So with that, we would love to hear from you, the audience. A lot we talked about in this episode and, and we would love any of you who actually work for game companies. We would absolutely love to hear from you of what has been your experience. If you actually work in the industry and you've you've seen this over time, maybe one side or the other, but we would love to hear your perspective on things because yeah. this is something that it's not going away. I mean, let's be honest. This is something that is here to stay. You have entire staffing models built uh, for both extremes of the solo uh, developer as well as the thousand person team. But we'd love to get your take on it. So hit us up on businesscasualgamers.com. Let us know. Tweet at us. Whatever it takes. We would love to get your feedback. So, Chris, we're going to go on to our game assignments. Yes, and this is one yes. I really want to hear about. So you showed me a little bit last week of Thimbleweed Park. I, I Certainly a lot, of, a, a lot of warm and fuzzy memories mm-hmm, from clicking mm-hmm. on different parts and getting witty comments back at me mm-hmm. from my younger years for Maniac Mansion and the like. Talk me through this game. I, I want to give an overall overview because, again, this is the first episode we're going to be going to our one game yep. assignment. So yep. we're going to have a little bit more quality time to spend on this. I'm going to ask some questions later in the episode, but I want to hear just your initial impression. Mm-hmm. What jumped out to you about the game? Well, you know Child of Eden? It's I not. Do. It's not that at all. It's so, 180 so, degrees from that. I so eat, so it's, it's bad. Good. It's, no, it's uh, extremely oh, oh, okay. good. I see where you're going with this. Okay. Uh, no, Child of Eden is not good. Anyway, no, I, I mean, all I can say about this game is just wow. And and here's the thing. I'm coming from, you know, mid-30s, kind of old grizzled kind of guy who, who, who you know, grew up playing games like Maniac Mansion and Monkey Island, right? The Secret of Monkey Island. I love all those games. If you don't like those games, uh, you will hate this game. <laughs> like, it, it does go hand in hand. If you like those games... Uh, and certainly if you've played them, if they kind of represent nostalgia for you, you have to, you owe it to yourself to play this game. I mean, it was, it's just amazing. Absolutely amazing in every way. And and here, I, I made a list of some of the things that were just hilarious. Um, number one, it, you know, it's the old school look and feel. I mentioned it's pixelated last time. It, it looks and feels very much like an 8-bit kind of a game, but it's obviously a higher resolution. It's obviously snappier. It's, you know, it's got all the positives of a real, you know, I say futuristic, a real modern style um, video game, and you'll really enjoy that. The thing that has always made me extremely happy, particularly in Monkey Island uh, and those types of games, is just the humor. The understated, the awkward, the crazy, the upside down humor, and sometimes over the top humor uh, that the game developers put into games like this. And, And Thimbleweed Park is absolutely just astoundingly hilarious. 
one thing I will mention that some people get put off by the by games that break the fourth wall. Okay. Um, if you if you don't like games breaking the fourth wall, don't play this game because they break it like every five minutes. But it is so hilarious. Just they use it as the butt of their jokes for so many things. They talk about, um, for example, there's a point in the game where they talk about how game designers had uh, had done some research and realized that games aren't fun when you die a lot. So they've engineered good, good uh, you know, adventure game designers will engineer the game so that you never die. And of course, in this game, you can never die. Nice. Spoiler alert. Um, and so they talk about how that's a little more difficult to, de- you know, it's more challenging for the developers and they have to be smarter at what they do to be able to build a game that that's still fun. You don't die and there's no, you know, but there's still some tension in the game. It's it's just absolutely hilarious. Um, they they reference all of the old game designers. They have tons and tons of Easter eggs from Maniac Mansion and Mon- uh, Monkey Island. If you played either of those games and remember any of it, you'll see uh, oodles and oodles of things. Um, I want to give them a little mini assignment to people who are actually going to play this game. At some point in the game, you will come to an occult bookstore. Okay. And the occult bookstore has books in it. And there are lots and lots and lots of books. And I, I amused myself for... I'm not even going to tell you how long, <laughs> a long time just climbing this ladder and looking at the names of these books. And it's funny, it's actually how it came up. You know, this was a crowdfunded game and they crowdsourced the titles of all those, those games, oh, those, really those cool. books, but all the books have references to other, you know, pop culture, other game things. It's absolutely hilarious uh, to, 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 to piece together that, uh, that part of the game is just really fun. The story itself, you know, it's a, it's a normal kind of adventure story. It's a whodunit. You know, no spoilers necessarily, but it starts with a dead body. And, and you are part of uh, a couple of characters over time that will try to figure out what happened with murder in Thimbleweed Park. And, and a lot of weird things occur throughout the game uh, that, that you know, make you kind of think and wonder what's going on. And, and, you know, it's fun how you start to learn th- how things happen here. Uh, they have lots of fun puzzles. There are two difficulty levels. One of them kind of minimizes the puzzles. Uh, another one... Uh, kind of quote unquote maximizes the puzzles in a sense. Um, I think that's really cool, uh, honestly, because the the puzzles tend to focus on your enjoyment. There, you know, there are a couple of them I'll talk about in a little while that that really do kind of trip you up a little bit. Uh, and they do, you know, if you've ever played these games, there are there's going to be not quite as bad as Castlevania two. You know, get okay. the get the gem or whatever, and go to the far left and kneel for kneel. like forty five seconds, whatever it might be, ninety seconds. You know, it's not that bad. But there are some weird things out there that are um, that are available, uh, and and some of them will get you, some of them won't. For example, there's one that uh, I don't think it's a big spoiler, but there's a there's a uh, a staircase, and this is this is actually a reference to another part of the game or another another game. Uh, you go to a staircase, and it has an out of order sign on it. And how do you get past the out of order sign, or how do you how do you make the staircase in order? You pick up the sign, uh, and then the staircase is in order again. So. It's really cool to see how you do those things. And so, you know, at the bottom left of the screen, you have a number of action verbs that happen like talk or look at, go move, whatever, push, pull. And you basically have this kind of a thing where you click, you know, push, and you click on something on the thing and you'll try and push that or they'll try and combine things or whatever. And so it's really funny how, uh, number one, you know, back in the early days of gaming, like maybe mid to late 80s into the early 90s, you had games like Leisure Suit Larry where you'd have to type these things out. And it was always horrible uh, try and figure out how you, you know, how you reference things. So you have a bottle of Coca-Cola on the on the table. Pick up Coke. I don't understand. Pick up soda. I don't understand. Pick up pop. Pick up the pop, right? Right. Or whatever it is, right? And those, you know, trying to figure that stuff out was really frustrating. But the cool part about this game is they seem to have built this big, like, uh, and they actually have a name for it in the game when they break the fourth wall yet again. Uh, for how all the elements in the game uh, kind of react to one another and how people uh, how people respond um, uh, to certain things and the entire the entire dialogue is is all uh, uh, is all audio, uh, is all audio so you can hear it all it's really nice and so some of the things you see are um, when you try and combine things that don't make sense they always have hilarious little quips about uh, things going on and. And if you keep doing it, you keep doing it. They usually have like eight or ten hilarious quips for every little thing. That's cool. And all that said, it's really cool to piece it together. The other thing that I I really enjoyed about the game, uh, and this is harkens back to the Maniac Mansion days, is that you know I mentioned you play a few characters, and over the course of the game, you start with two characters. Over the course of the game, you may or may not collect a couple more that that come up in different times. And at any point, you can well almost at any point. Sometimes they restrict it. 
but you can take uh, you can take the take control of any one of those characters and see things from their world, uh, and it's really cool because you can see their perspective, you can see how their part of the story is told, and so on. Uh, I'll say that one thing that I did not like that really did kind of break it for me in some areas was that if I have say two two primary characters and they are in different parts of the world, uh, and one of them learns about something like the grass is green over here and they immediately switch to the other character. The other character knows and references the grass is green. And you're like, I know why they did it because it would just be so miserable to figure out like, Oh, where, which character figured out the grass is green. And then I have to go tell them somehow, whatever they just kind of set state state is global and it goes across the entire set of characters, which does bother me sometimes, but that's just a, a, a minor quip. Now, let me ask you one thing, Chris, because this is something that when I think back, I did play a lot of Maniac Mansion. Mm-hmm. I always liked about that game the fact that you had, I can't remember the total number, it was six or something like that, but you had three characters that mm-hmm. you took effectively, and they all had different abilities, and mm-hmm. it, it, the game played in a different way depending on who you selected. I mean, you mentioned there are different characters that you meet. Does your path through the game generate? I mean, is there kind of one way to play through the game, or depending on the characters and the situations, are there mm-hmm. branching paths to the game? I think there's only one path. Okay, basically. no, that's fair. Uh, and I think it's you know it's I I the way I thought about it is kind of keep it simple. The game's like 15 hours or so if you get a lot of stuff, and and so no, it's not that it's not that level of depth. Um, there's no unique areas of each of each, you know, there's no like, oh, well, this character has a special weapon or special whatever. None of that stuff really works out. Um, but sometimes you do have to have the right character in the right place at the right time to get something to happen. And and, and that to me is pretty cool. Um, the other things I'll mention, small little things, you know, I mentioned some of the puzzles can be really big time suckers. Sometimes it's like you don't really know what you're supposed to do. And, and they're, it's a little bit vague. And I, I'll admit to having to, to Google one or two of those over the course of the game just to kind of move me along. Small little quip, though. Uh, not a big deal, uh, honestly. The other thing and that it really did to me that was uh, satisfying and also kind of scary <laughs> is that they have these random things that you have to collect for no reason. For example, there are specks of dust. This is like okay. the duty calls, the yes. picking up a pack of loose leaf, yes. wide ruled paper. Yes, exactly. So you'll be walking through, you know, an area and you'll see a pixel that's discolored. And you're like, what's that? And you hover over it and speck of dust. Well, a speck of dust. What do I do with that? I can pick it up, I guess. Okay. So you pick up a speck of dust and then slowly you start finding these specks of dust everywhere. And there are many of them. And if you collect them all, you get an achievement. But I mean, it's like, I would, I would literally like go to one one zone or one area and then come back and be like, oh my God, there's a speck of dust there. I need to get it. <laughs> yeah. Check all the way back to go get this thing. So, so let me ask, the, my major question when I knew this was going to be the assignment was you mentioned the fact that if you love the genre, if you love these games, this one, mm-hmm. you think you're going to love it. If you didn't like them, you're not going to like it. I have not played this genre. I, I have not gone back to Maniac Mansion since Maniac Mansion was released. I, I played... Uh, certainly some of the Lucas mm-hmm. Arts games I played adventure or, or uh, monkey Island. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I remember the, I think the last time I played a game like this was Zach and wiki for the Wii. Now mm-hmm. that game was a pile of crap and I don't care what any of you in the audience say, this is like wow. my child of Eden where everybody wow. loves that game. And I think it's garbage, uh, but I have not really played a game like this that I like since maniac mansion. But I can't say I've really gone back to the genre. Mm-hmm. I'm curious if I even like it anymore. So so what are your thoughts on when I watched you play a little bit of this game, hmm. the nostalgia definitely rushed in. But right. part of what I kept thinking was, is this genre this many years, 20 years later, is this genre still even fun? I don't know if you've gone back to it more recently than I have, but what do you say to the person who's wondering, yeah, well, I like these games in the past, but I don't even know if this style of game holds up. What, what was your impression of that? Uh, no, I, I, well, I have a lot of nostalgia as well, and I'll say that it made me want to go out and play these games more, okay. um, I think. I mean, so, but you have to be the kind of person. So, for example, uh, I remember a whole bunch of random quotes about ripping kneecaps off from Sam and Max Hit the Road, right? And that's a really weird. It's kind of like remembering, you know, Aaron and I both watched a lot of The Simpsons, an inordinate amount of The Simpsons in our lifetime. And we can we can have way too many quotes to just pop out in random <laughs> conversation, completely inappropriate. But, 
you know, the funny part about it is it's kind of like that. Like, I remember a lot of Simpsons stuff. I remember a lot of stuff from Sam and Max and Day of the Tentacle and, and, you know, Monkey Island 1 and 2 and all these games. You know, I think I think it's hilarious. I love the hot, off-color humor. I think a lot of people that like those kinds of things will definitely like this game. Um, but, you know, if you don't like... Uh, uh, like, for example, you know, one of the characters is... Uh, uh, is an aspiring game designer and she has all this stuff about game designing and it's all referencing like self-referential for the for the designers themselves and other game designers and all that if you don't get you know a little bit of this it doesn't seem like it would be a little bit of a fun thing to explore uh, that kind of interaction and how the game plays on it then you know I would say yeah, maybe it's not for you but then again the game is super cheap I mean I think it would if you if you liked Monkey Island and other games like that I think you're definitely gonna like this game. And moreover, you're going to continue to promote them uh, to help them understand that people really love these kinds of adventure games and they want more of them. Let me ask another question for our, our BCG audience. So you mentioned like a 15-hour playtime. What if somebody were to say, I don't really know about this genre at all. I didn't play these growing up. I'm kind of new to this genre. I don't know that I might be into it for 15 hours, but what you're describing sounds kind of fun. I'd like to see some of the quirky humor. Let's say you were to cut it off at five hours. Do you think that would be time well spent? Would somebody enjoy their time with the game? Or is this one where you feel like if you don't see it through or you don't get to this part of the game, you're, you're missing out or you're not going to have as much fun? No, no. I, th- I, think you, I think you would like it. I think almost if you have a sense of humor and you like humorous games and you're not looking for like a gut-wrenching, you know, sad story or some sort of drama – uh, you're nothing wrong with that, of course. But if you're not looking for that kind of game, you want a kind of carefree game that's kind of, that's loose with a whole bunch of stuff. I think you would really, really enjoy the game. And honestly, I think you get to the point where you play for an hour, and if you don't really want to know what happens or how it continues on, then put the thing down. It's it's not you know. If, honestly, you probably wasted more money on a bad lunch um, in your past than you will on this game. Uh, but what will probably happen is you'll play it for an hour or two and you'll realize, what's going on here? I really want to know what's going on. It's kind of kooky. I want to I hear more jokes. I want to hear more story pan out. And you'll keep playing. And, you know, eventually you'll just end at the end. And that, that's that's really what happened to me. I I didn't rush it. I just kept playing, kept playing until finally I found myself at the end of the game. And, you know, while it's, well, I, again, I don't think the story is like a beautiful, amazing story. It's It's all about the ride. Yeah. So let me ask final question. Let's say they were to make a sequel to this game and were to say, hey, we, 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 we're glad you liked it. We're glad you had a great mm-hmm. time. We're immediately starting work on the sequel. Two-part question. One, would you be down for a sequel to this game? And if you were, what would you want to see added, changed, you know, amended in the sequel? Ooh, that's a good point. Um, so I think I would definitely be down for a sequel, number one. Uh, I think the characters are cool enough, and I'd love to see a handful or all of those characters come back together in some weird way. It wouldn't be in Thimbleweed Park. I, I, I'm i a big proponent of thinking up new settings of these kinds of games. Um, but I think that I'd love to see where they go with that, honestly. Um, yeah, all, all in all, I don't know. I, I think that... Uh, Maybe put it differently too. How long would it take before you'd want to see the sequel? I always feel like sometimes I need a break from a a genre or a game. You know, is this a, I'll play it in two years. I'd rather play it in five years. I'd play it in a year, I think. I mean, honestly, it's not that, uh, you know, I would play another game. I would play another game like this uh, inside of six months, certainly, just because I really enjoy those kinds of games. And they're just so few and far between. And the ones that are done well are rare. Uh, but with this, if you talk, think about the context of, you know, with the Thimbleweed Park characters or whatever, I think in general, any, almost any game you pick, I want to have a nine to 12 month gap between me revisiting those characters, okay. you know, every iteration. So I, you know, I, I really think that it, uh, I hope they continue on. I hope they have a new, uh, a new area that you can explore. I mean, I'm a little bit kooky enough. Honestly, I would say that I wouldn't be uh, against uh, another kind of a uh, like a murder, same kind of scenario, just to make it kind of kooky, kind of kind of stupid in a sense. Um, but tie it back to Monkey Island, put it on the island itself, and, I think and that'd like be cool. you know those kinds of things. I'm sure licensing would prevent that, but I mean, go back to those kinds of things. It'd be really fun to see. Well, that's great. Well, this sounds like a really fun game. I know there's a lot of our audience who grew up enjoying games like what we described with Monkey Island and Maniac Mansion, so. This sounds like a great one. So yeah, uh, Thimbleweed yeah. Park, check it out if that's something you're into. 
So, Chris, what have you got for me this coming week? I am I am excited to learn. I've, I've played a metric ton of Persona 5. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. I have loved my time with it. I am almost through my second playthrough of the game, as a matter of fact. Really? Yes, I'm I almost done with the second the playthrough. Last. Oh, my gosh. However, I am certainly looking to move on to a different game. I, I, I've had a lot of it, so I'm looking forward to, like, the sorbet at the end of the meal. The sorbet. Let, let, let's get the palate cleanse going on. Okay. What have you got okay. for me? Okay, so this one, again, so to, to kind of reiterate how we're doing this now, because we do this bi-weekly and because we're all business casual gamers in a sense, we don't have lots and lots of time. We, we realized, we heard the feedback that two games, if you want to pick, if you want to play both games that Aaron and I are playing every uh, over the course of every two weeks, it's just too much. Um, so we're going with just one game. And so Aaron, I think that game needs to be, and I, I've heard this game a lot and I almost bought it and I haven't yet. I'm really glad now that I have a, an excuse to, to give it to you to see how you hate it. Uh, and then maybe I'll try it, and then we'll have another argument about how it works nice. right. But anyway, the game is Child of Light. I'm excited. I, I've yeah. heard of this game, and we we talked about it leading up to this. Uh, you know, I've heard. I don't know. I've heard it's an RPG. I know that much. Mm-hmm. Or, mm-hmm. But and I've I've seen good review scores for it. It's on the Vita, so I'm always there down with a new Vita game, See? even though I think it's available for other platforms. Well, I think hang it's on, PS4. hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's let's pause for a second here. <laughs> I know where this is going, ladies and gentlemen. Did you just hear what came out of that man's mouth? You you go back and you listen to the episodes around this time last year, March, April, May, June, July, whatever. How many times did I fight him about this Vita and how great it is and how he hemmed it hot about getting it, blah, blah, blah. And then to make a statement like that, all I'm going to say it's really is good. I'm right. He is. He uh, okay. Look, okay. I, I am in. For the record. I can swallow my words when I'm wrong. <laughs> the Vita was totally worth it. Sweet. I would still, I would pick it up a used version because you can yeah, get of course, it pretty of course, cheap of course. nowadays, but it was mm-hmm, great. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, I'm really looking forward to this game. I have lots of time to sink into this, so I am I do not know how long it is, but I am hopefully coming back, uh, even though I think I want to finish Persona the second time this weekend. I will come back next show having made some some very meaningful progress of not beating the game. Very good, very good. And, and, and I think now that we're kind of moving into this uh, this single assignment per episode, I also like to, to kind of do another challenge to the audience, or at least uh, try to incorporate some new uh, focus for the audience. If you're playing this game... Uh, and you're interested in, in kind of keeping along with us, we really want to start incorporating a little bit more feedback where we get it from people. And I know maybe you're not going to be busy, you're going to be too busy to do these kinds of things. But if you do play the game, make sure you tweet at us at Biz, yeah. BIS Casual Gamers. Make sure you, you get in touch with us. Let us know uh, your opinions as well. And now that we're having more time to talk about every single game, we can also take those opinions and can talk about how you know certain listeners did or didn't like these aspects of the game as well. And we can integrate that into the conversation. So it's one other, another way for you to kind of interact with us uh, on future shows. Totally agree. And I will definitely be tweeting as I play this game. And please respond to those. Post your own tweets. We, we would love to read those. Yep. And so with that, I think we will wrap this episode up. Uh, episode 36 will come to a close. Please make sure you check us out at businesscasualgamers.com. You please take the time, if you wouldn't mind, to rate us on iTunes. Just give us how many stars you want and put a period in there. It doesn't really matter what it says. We just want to have uh, some more of those ratings. And, of course, Aaron is, of course, trying to bribe you. I got games. Uh, for that. I got really lots of games. Bad games. Anyway, take a look. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Now that we have um, better internet connection, we have 4K videos now going up. You'll have a lot better, higher, higher quality things. Uh, to, to watch for. Uh, I'm doing some more BC Live things. You'll see a lot more of that streaming coming up soon once I find some things that are fun. Aaron and I are going to be doing a little bit more retro reruns. I know that we've taken a little bit of time off on those. It's just been very hectic for everyone. So what we're going to do is we're going to get some time, more reruns coming, maybe some interesting things aside from that also to be put on YouTube as well. You'll have to check out for that. The best way to keep in touch with us along all those lines, of course, is at Twitter, at BIS Casual Gamers. And uh, with that, we'll bring this episode to a close. See you soon.